Go for it, Arif. Great. Um, hi, everybody. I'm so excited to introduce Mike Morell today. Uh, and as always, we're going to keep the introduction short and let our speakers introduce themselves and tell us about their living histories. So, Mike, I'm super excited to um, hear about your living histories. Well, thank you very much. So thank you for having me. So, yep, I'm, I'm Mike Morell. I am a professor in um, biomedical engineering and physics at Yale. Um, I'm also part of the Systems Biology Institute, where my lab is located. We study a broad range of um, biophysical problems, largely aimed at understanding how the kind of active non-equilibrium properties of the cell's internal machinery influences um, cell behaviors. So um, a bit about myself. So I am um, originally from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, specifically the 53206 neighborhood, a little north of um, a neighborhood known as Bronzeville. Uh, so Milwaukee, Wisconsin is a super interesting and vibrant place. Um, it's known for its, its arts and culture. It's kind of a center of African-American culture um, and Latino culture. Um, it's kind of like an artist colony. It's known for its kind of murals throughout the city, um, through, for its museums on, on things like African-American history. Um, and so it was a very vibrant and interesting place to, um, to grow up. Um, so where my interests in science began um, came from um, uh, basically a, a very strong um, implied push to um, pursue advanced education. So um, the history of, of college education goes back um, quite far in my family. Um, pretty much the, the, um, the first generation after that, the last one enslaved went to university. Um, and so at that time, they went to uh, historically black colleges and universities. And so um, what you see on the upper left is a photo of some great, great uncles um, who went to Kentucky State University, a historically black college in, in the state of Kentucky. Um, so they attended, as did a large number of people on that side of the family, um, and, and that kind of continued throughout the generations. So um, my uncles and aunts went there, my grandfather went there, and then other family members went to other places. Um, some met at a well-known HBCU, Howard University in Washington, D.C., and so I like to make a plug for um, these universities because they've had a really, really large role in promoting education for African-Americans. And they continue to um, educate a really large number of African-Americans and those that are actually very significantly involved in STEM. Um, and so it was pretty much um, a foregone conclusion that I was expected to go to university and to study something interesting and then do something, do something cool with my life. Um, so with science, in regards to science in particular, I had a um, good role model so um, my uncle um, uh, um, was a applied mathematician. And so he studied um, a lot about learning methods, um, uh, a lot about control theory. He applied a lot of this to neural networks, you know, kind of very broadly in this field called operations research or, or complex systems analysis. And so I just kind of idolized this guy. I thought he was the coolest person. He obviously looks very, very cool. Um, and, and yet he was an extraordinarily nerdy scientist. Um, so he somehow balanced those well. And so he was a really large inspiration for me wanting to be a scientist. Um, when I was growing up, I didn't understand anything of what he was saying, but I thought it was amazing. And, you know, I wanted to basically be just like him. Um, um, and so even as a little kid, I remember hanging out in his, you know, office as a postdoc, um, and trying desperately to to figure out what it was he studied. Um, and so um, in high school is kind of where I decided that I really liked physics. Um, I went to a uh, Jesuit school in, in the center of the city and uh, called Marquette University High School. And it was a great place. I had lots of great teachers, but one of the people that really st uh, stood out the most was um, my, my, my physics teacher here, um, 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 Father Stang. And so uh, he took a special interest. You know, I was coming from the inner city into this very nice school. I was having trouble adjusting and, you know, interacting. 
And he was extraordinarily patient and, and, and very, um, very helpful with the material. And through my interactions with him, I kind of fell in love with physics itself. So it really goes to show how, you know, personal interactions can really kind of influence the, the trajectory that someone takes. So um, <clears throat> I basically decided then that I wanted to go um, to college to, um, oops, to, to study physics. Um, shortly after I got there, I decided to actually switch to engineering. I kind of decided I really liked um, biology. Um, so um, I went to um, Johns Hopkins and, and um, studied bioengineering and material science. So specifically on my intellectual trajectory, I feel like that story is best told through, through the people. Um, and so here are a bunch of my mentors, official and unofficial, as well as um, other people that have come through my lab recently, whom I also um, feel like I've learned a lot from. So I started off um, working at, at Johns Hopkins with Andre Levchenko, um, who at the time was doing mostly theoretical modeling of, of, of biological processes, things like intracellular um, biochemical networks and things like this. As, as fate would have it, he later moved to Yale and his lab is now adjacent to mine. So this was the first lab that I joined as an undergraduate, um, and now our labs are joined, um, which was pretty cool. Um, over, in, uh, I then went on to MIT to study um, more mechanobiology with Roger Cam, and then most of, I guess, my kind of current intellectual interests stem from some very good um, mentoring that I had from my two postdoctoral advisors, uh, Margaret Gardell and, and Cecile Sykes at the Institute Curie. And then kind of my you know, unofficial training um, and other aspects of, of the science from people like Francoise Rochard and, and Eric Dufresne. So my, my first experience, um, this is me and a friend, we took a picture literally for a moment like this. We, we literally said like, what if in like 30 years, we want to, um, we want to have like that, that, that posed picture um, of us. So there, this was literally for nothing else other than to be really nerdy and, 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 and imagine what, what it would be like. So um, I initially entered in college and studied, you know, this kind of burgeoning field of systems biology. We were really interested in, in how um, biochemical pathways are altered, um, in particular, in this case, metabolic pathways, when you change the amount of um, metabolite that goes through them. And so um, we, I did experimental work and we did computational work. Um, and I also studied um, uh, red blood cell differentiation. And so um, I wrote a model to try and basically predict the interactions between progenitor cells that would yield the most stable outcome of red blood cells. So I had a ball. I was able to work with this guy, Andre Levchenko, like nearly exclusively. He was a brand new professor. So I had his time pretty much all to myself. I was a late person at the time, he was as well. So almost every single day I could walk into his office at 8 p.m. and we could talk for hours on science. And so I was extraordinarily, extraordinarily lucky um, to have that experience. Um, so I actually went to graduate school to do more systems biology work. Um, I initially went to go work with um, Adam, uh, um, um, Alexander Van Udenarden in the physics department on noise and gene expression. Um, while I was there in the lab, there was a young, brilliant postdoc um, by the name of Margaret Gardell, um, who I got really fascinated by her science. I remember you know, talking with her about things that she was doing and she was telling me, for, for example, like, Oh, I find it really amazing that you know entropy can play a role in the mechanics of cells. And I, I remember I was like, shut up, you know, like that sounds really interesting. Um, and basically from then on, I was hooked. So I was really interested in working with her. She was on her way to Chicago, but she recommended that I work um, with some biomechanics people um, at MIT and at Harvard. And so I ended up kind of uh, working with um, with Roger Cam, and I did a lot of my work over in the Dave Waits group. I mean, I interacted with Mahadevan and, and others, and I had a really good time. Um, uh, the 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 things I focused on at the time were looking at the collective motion of cells. 
Um, we used, you know, traditional soft matter approaches. We looked at how the organization of cells kind of varied with the mechanical environment that they were in. Um, we modeled their motion as kind of wetting and, and de-wetting transitions. So this is kind of where a lot of the soft matter science that I, I still do kind of comes in. Um, and so that was a really good experience. Um, I was able to work with a lot of different people um, during my PhD. Um, while I had an advisor and, and the head of a committee, um, Dave Waits, who was really influential, I worked with a lot of other people on biophysical problems over those years. I worked um, a little bit with Maran Kardar, with, with other people at, at, at Harvard, and it was a really, really good experience. So that definitely kind of solidified my interests um, in biophysics. Um, and so I had gone to um, a, a conference where I met um, Cecile Sykes and she was describing how she was engineering these like biomimetic cells basically. And again, I immediately fell in love with what she was working on. Um, and so I was supposed to be finishing my PhD um, a little bit early, so I had some time. And so I went out to Paris to work with her for a few months and learned essentially all of her techniques on how to engineer these things. We learned a little bit about their physics, but again, treating them as droplets, so on and so forth. Um, and, that was, and that was really awesome. Um, this is just another ex example of some of the works we did with droplets. So upon leaving the Curie Institute, I was going to the University of Chicago, which was kind of the formal postdoc that I had had. Um, I reached out to Margaret Gardell after five years, um, and thankfully she had a spot open, um, and so I joined her in the lab all those years after wanting to work with her in the first place. Um, and so um, uh, in her group, you know, we focused a lot on trying to understand the interactions between actin and myosin, uh, proteins in the cell cytoskeleton. Um, and so we were studying the nature of contractility and disorganized networks. So I got to learn more about protein reconstitution, um, which kind of sparked a lot of our current interests um, in, in, in non-equilibrium things. And so basically all of this has kind of led up to um, what we try and study today. We continue a lot of our assembly of, of um, biological systems where we try and control the consumption of, of chemical energy by, by, by these enzymes and, and observe their effects. Um, we're very interested in understanding how far it drives the system from equilibrium. So we, we do some work in things like entry production. Um, and, then, and then we continue on some of our you know, interfacial models where we, we treat things like droplets and we wet them onto surfaces. It's a surprisingly applicable and, 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 and broadly useful um, approach. And so I, I guess I'll just stop there. That's, that's basically how I've gotten to where we are today. Hey, thank you so much, Mike. That was a wonderful talk. Um, and I think we have time for uh, one quick question, if anybody has one. So I have a question, yeah. which is similar to the question I was asked. Why did you decide to be an engineer in the first place? Can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah. So for I, you know, when I went to went to college, it was to study it was to study physics, and actually, but just being at at Johns Hopkins, there was so much like biological research going on that I, I felt saturated by it, and eventually got really interested in it. And uh, there was a very very popular major there, probably probably a good quarter of the students study biomedical engineering, um, and so I thought that this was an interesting outlet um, at the time. You though had to study um, a separate engineering major as well um, to make it um, biomedical engineering, which, and, and so I chose material science because I just felt that that was kind of the closest thing to what I was studying before. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's basically how it came. It came from an interest in biology and then the, the most proximal way to study biology with a quantitative slant was kind of a bioengineering major. Thanks. Uh, there's a question in the chat from Ali. Do you, do you want to um, unmute yourself and just ask? Um, I can read it or... Yeah, I, I, okay, okay. Um, no problem. So it's a question about um, short-term versus long-term. Um, how um, have you decided what's a short-term interest versus a long-term one? Oh, that's a good question. Um, 
I'm not sure we, ha I, I guess everything is that if, if you went by how long it took me to get a grant and get something published, essentially everything would be quite long-term. Um, so <laughs> so um, I think that um, most of the projects that, that we've had have, you know, um, multiple threads to them that require, you know, pretty long investigations. So um, like assembling these, these, these um, like biomimetic systems from scratch, you know, experimental work can take, you know, a very, very long time. So I actually am not, not really sure what I would consider um, um, short term, but also we, a lot of what we do is kind of exploratory and we find what we find. So I guess sometimes, you know, spontaneously we find something and, and, and try and write it up quickly. So I would say by accident maybe is how we determine short term versus long term is unfortunately the best way I could explain it. Yeah, that's a fair way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. And I think uh, it's time to move on. Uh, let's thank